All right, so we're going to be talking about this morning is that freedom fighters, they know there is a high cost to pay, but they're willing to pay the price. And so this is the series we've been in, uh, Freedom Fighters, and what we talked about is, is, is that normally we think of someone that's rising up against a government authority, um, but what we've said is that I believe that God wants to see in us that is that the body of Christ, we are fighting for the freedom. We are fighting for the message that he came to this earth to spread, uh, what he did uh, for each one of us. And there is a force that we're fighting against. And he is a cunning enemy, and he does everything he can to hold us down, to oppress us, um, to direct our lives. And so as freedom fighters, we've talked about how we need to have unbroken resolve. We've talked about freedom fighters are worshipers. And we've walked through a lot of different things, but today we are talking about how a freedom fighter understands that there is a very steep cost, but they're willing to pay the price. And so I want to I want to begin to explain to you what I mean by that. Uh, I want to read a scripture that I'm going to be pulling out of um, uh, throughout the service, and so um, and uh, that is out of Philippians 1, 20 through 21. I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed, but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. For to me, to live is Christ and to die is gain. What an awesome scripture. God, I want to believe that I will have the courage to stand up for what I believe in. God, I want to know that I will have the courage to not deny you. I want to know that what I'm saying I believe in is real to me. Where I'm not out there trying to lose my life, but I'm also not fearing losing my life or other things in life for my beliefs, for what I stand for. And so freedom fighters, they understand the cost is high and the price could be their lives. But here's the key. See, the world wants us uh, to, you know, the, the easy example is to look at the missionary that goes overseas and someone says, hey, you're going into a dangerous part of the world. Uh, you could lose your life. The world wants to say, don't do that. Look at, the, look at the, what could happen. But a son of God, a daughter of God, understand that I'm not trying to lose my life, but I'm willing to answer the call of God on my life, and I'm willing to give everything. So that what I want to emphasize this morning, as we're going to get into it, is what I'm not talking about is I'm not talking about thrill-seeking where I'm out there taking chances. I'm talking about someone who understands, understand what the price could be and are willing to stand on that. We're going to talk about some examples in the Bible. Um, and I think when we get through with this, we're going to realize that, you know, we can all sit here and go, well, I don't know if I'm ever going to fear for my life for what I'm asked to do. I, I don't know that either. I'm not sure. I don't know what God will ask me to do. I don't know what God will ask you or I to do. But I, I know that what we can look at is, is, we might not, on an everyday basis, fear losing our life, but we fear losing a lot of things at times. And we allow a lot of things in our lives to control us through fear, and that will determine whether we stand up for what we believe in. And so that's what I want us to also focus on this morning. Losing your life isn't the worst. Dying without believing is losing everything. And so uh, this morning we're going to be watching a video. Um, I want you to watch this video. I want you, uh, it, it's an amazing uh, few minutes of, of someone we're going to talk about and, uh, and how, and the lessons we're going to pull out of that. And then we're also going to walk through some stories in the Word and show that example in, in, in some stories that God has given us in, in His Word. And so would you watch this video?
Some of you might know that that is Alex Honnold. Um, there was actually one of the documentaries made about his climbing. Actually, I believe just won one of the Oscars um, for the documentary. Um, someone told me, well, you, you know he's an atheist. And I said, I actually do know that. If you, anybody's listened to anything Alex has talked, he's very clear. He's an atheist. And he stands for a lot of things I don't believe in. What I do know is he's a phenomenal climber. What I do know is that he is an unbelievable creation of our king. And whether he believes in that creator or not, that's his choice, which makes what he's doing and why I want to talk about him this morning even more important. Because a guy that doesn't believe in a God, what you notice in some of those clips is I believe like one of those he had ropes on. Uh, if, you, if you study Alex, uh, what you find out is about 90% of the time he does climb like everybody else with ropes, but he's not just a normal climber. He's known as one of the best of all time. Uh, he probably will go down right now as one of the, uh, probably the best free climber. Free climbing is without ropes. Um, and so he's broken many world records. He's climbed many things that other men ha uh, women and, and women have failed at. Um, he's, he's climbed some things for the first time without ropes that people with ropes have not been able to climb. One of his biggest accomplishments was he was the first person to climb uh, El Capitan, which is a 3,000-foot wall in Yosemite uh, National Park. Uh, look that up. Just look at that from pictures from way back. Um, he did it without any rope, and he did it in under four hours. He was the first person to ever do it. He's phenomenal at climbing. Um, and so I want to share a little bit about what I learned about him and why I believe it goes directly with what we're talking about this morning. And I want you to remember something as we're talking about that, that what we, what we want to emphasize is that losing your life isn't the worst thing. That dying without believing is losing everything. It's, it's not the desire of a freedom fighter to die. That's not what we're talking about. Our desire should be to live on serving him. Do you realize it's his desire for you to live on serving him? He wants to be able to use you mightily in his kingdom. However, on the other hand, a freedom fighter does not fear death, and death does not have control over them. Losing something in life does not have control over a freedom fighter. And so the, kite, the cost is very high in the world's view, very high. In fact, they'll tell you that it's too high. But the sacrifice of Jesus Christ made every sacrifice I make in my life completely worth it. And so we just watched the video of Alex. And I want to read a couple things. He's the first and only person to free solo El Capitan. We just talked about that. And holds the fastest ascent of Yosemite Triple Crown. An 18 hour and 15 minute, 50 minute link up of Mount Watkins, the nose, and the regular northwest face of Half Dome. If you look up some of these things, I challenge you to look up some of his clips. You'll sit there amazed at what he's able to accomplish. Honnold was born in Sacramento, California. He started climbing in a, in a climbing gym at the age of five and was climbing many times a week by the age of 10. He participated in many national and international youth climbing championships as a teenager. Listen to this quote from him. I was never like a bad climber as a kid, but I had never been a great climber either. He says, there were a lot of other climbers who were much, much stronger than me, who started as kids and were like instantly freakishly strong, like they just have a natural gift. And that was never me. I just loved climbing. And I've been climbing all the time ever since. So I've naturally gotten better at it. But I've never been gifted. So here's this guy that's accomplishing these personal records. And he says, I was never the, really the best. But what I've done is spent a ton of time growing in it. He holds many records. Uh, that we t Some of them we talked about. If you look up some of the others, uh, like I said, his, his, what he has done is amazing. But what I loved about watching some of the clips of him talk, watching some of the people that were interviewed about Alex that have either climbed with him or know him, there was a common theme in all the interviews. And what it was was they talked about his passion and his love for climbing. 
but they also made it very clear that most people would look at Alex when he's free climbing without ropes going, why? Why would you do that? This guy's got to be like the guy that just wants to cheat death. He's out there uh, uh, risk, uh, uh, just throwing his life away doing this. In fact, in 2013, one of his largest sponsors that allowed him to have this life of full-time climbing backed out and said, we will not sponsor free climbers anymore because there's undue risk involved. And yet he still does it. So all these people, they talked about his passion and his love for climbing, that it became his life. I think he went to his freshman year of college. I believe in the middle of that year, his parents got divorced. He ends up uh, not completing his first year of school, hates school, leaves, lives in a car, and begins just driving around climbing. He was passionate about his love of climbing. And everybody around them knew it, and they could see it. But what they made clear was is that this isn't a guy just out there being a daredevil. He's not out there just saying, hey, uh, I'm just going to throw my life away. No, this is a man they talked about that would train and research his routes, his gear, everything, the timing. He would do more than anybody else in their group. He would climb more than anybody else in their group. He would train for these unbelievably record, unbelievable record uh, climbing routes for years before ever trying them. And the El Capitan, he tried once or twice before free climbing and had to quit. And he went back to training and then successfully did it, I believe in 2017 is when he first did it. And so what, what, was, what amazed me was that it wasn't this guy that was like when you see this and go, well, he just doesn't care about his life. He doesn't care about dying. No, he does. In fact, he talks about it. He says, listen, there are times, like the first time I tried to free climb El Capitan is that I backed off because I didn't have enough training in that route. And I knew I had gotten to a place where I couldn't move forward. And, I, and I, he, what he said was, is, I didn't want to wing it. I didn't want to wing it. He goes, there's a lot of climbers that, that, that will they'll go out and they'll, they'll find it. He's like, listen, that wasn't, I wasn't trying to just wing it. So I went back and began researching which route I was going to take, began training more, began looking into different things, and then went back like a year and a half later, not a week later, two weeks later, but a year, a year and a half later, and successfully made it. He wasn't just going to wing it. He wasn't just, he's not just out there thrill-seeking. He's out there because he loves climbing. He loves seeing a face that everybody, including himself, goes, I don't know how that's going to be possible. No one else has accomplished it. Or maybe I can do it, or maybe they have, but maybe I can do it faster. And what, what is, I, finding those places that push his ability, that push him into training, push him back into going, how do I get, how do I accomplish this? And so I want us to see that it was the love and the passion, a man that doesn't even believe in God, as something that he's so passionate about, that he's willing to risk his life for that love. And so what I'm asking us is our King, our Savior, our Lord, our God, our Heavenly Father, who has given us everything in this life, who's given us our lives, do we have the same love and passion that we see displayed in someone's life like Alex Honnold? Are we willing, and we've talked about this before, and I kind of fought that when writing these notes, is God, we've, we've kind of covered this subject, and I just really felt like he continued to want to ask us, are we willing to give up everything? What, what's holding us back from making that climb? What's holding us down from making that climb? from taking that first step. When I was watching this documentary, I, they, they really talked about points where, they even showed one point where he kind of got stuck on this attempt that they, the, the documentary actually was filming him on the successful, first successful attempt. The, the cameramen were roped 
and they were, they were filming him, and they show a couple points where they think he's going to turn back. And you can tell he gets stuck. And then you hear him talking, and he's like, no, 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 I got this. And he's, and you just, he's working through things. And he talks about how you can get paralyzed in fear, and you can't move, and you, you're, not gonna, you're not going to take the right steps and the right uh, hand holds, the right foot holds. And so you see him standing on this ledge in this documentary that's literally like that big, and he's got his back against the wall, and he just stops. And it's like he's gathering himself, and he's going back through his brain, and he's going, okay, the training, and, and, and this route, and what did I do here, and how could I go through this part? And then he moves on. And so what I'm asking us, what God is challenging us this morning, is what's holding us back from taking those steps? From getting to those places, those ledges, those rough spots in life, what's holding us back from stepping out in faith? You remember one of the old Indiana Jones where they did that, whatever, the bridge of whatever, but they couldn't see it, and they had to take that first step? What's keeping you from taking that step? God's not asking you to throw away your life. In fact, Megan and I were laughing. We talked on the way this morning. She said um, in Bible school there was this common theme by life or by death. And it was almost like the, the, the students got this false, uh, there was, they had created this false allure to uh, uh, being martyred. Like that would be, that's what we're, like it was almost like became this trophy they were talking about and praying about. And then it was like God checked them and said, hey, knucklehead, <laughs> I created you because I want to use you. I don't want you dead right now. That might happen in life. That's the worst thing that could happen to us physically. But what he's saying is this, I want you here because I created you to use you mightily in my kingdom, to spread my message, to bring others to me. I don't want you out there looking to lose it all. You're not out there trying to just say I'm throwing it all away, but you understand and you're willing to give it all up. There's a big difference. And I just began watching this story of Alex and going, God, I want to have such a passionate love for you that I'm willing to give everything at any time, any place for you. Megan, can I, can I ask my wife to come up and undo my water bottle and... <laughs> We're good. Maybe. So what are the examples in the Word we see this? Well, we, we've walked through the story of Daniel at times, and we know that story, but I want to highlight it. Because sometimes, like I said, we get so used to breezing our way through the common stories that we hear a lot that we don't really look at them. And so Daniel 6, here we have this man who's shown to have such a great and passionate love for his, his God that he's willing to give up everything. He wasn't, a willing to, he wasn't willing to allow anyone or anything to take the place of his relationship with God. He understood that his life could be taken. He understood what he was risking, but he was willing to sacrifice everything. He understood what the lion's den was. We just showed the clips of Alex. Alex understands when he's on those ledges what the result is if he makes... A mistake. What the result is, is if he takes one wrong foothold. Daniel understood what the lion's den was. Listen to me. You don't, he wasn't praying against the decree, trying to call the king's bluff. He, I don't think Daniel thought that the king was bluffing. I don't think Daniel thought that the, Daniel, the lion's den wasn't real or that this wasn't really going to happen. Listen, a kingdom doesn't have a, 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 a hole with lions in it unless on a regular basis they throw people into it. 
Okay? There's no point in having a lion's den if you're not using it for something. Daniel understood what the result could be. He understood the cost. But he was willing to sacrifice everything because the one thing he wasn't willing to give up was his relationship with his heavenly father. Daniel understood the consequences, but was willing to pay the price. He wasn't playing games with his life. He was standing for what he believed in. Another great example of a common story we talk about all the time is David and Goliath. David understood what he was walking into when he walked out on the battlefield. He didn't go out there thinking, you know what, I got this. I got this. Like, I as this young boy got this. I think I whipped that guy. I don't think that guy's very good. I think every other guy that's afraid of him, they're just, they're just idiots. They don't understand. I got this. Daniel didn't go out there not understanding the risk. David didn't walk out on that battlefield not realizing that that was a trained killer in front of him, that every other single man in the army his brothers were serving in, including his brothers, were scared to death of. He understood he was walking out on the battlefield to face a trained warrior. He understood the consequences, but again, he was willing to risk his life because of what he believed in. He believed in the power of his father, his heavenly father. I can't tell you, and the Bible doesn't tell you, that David knew without a shadow of a doubt what God was going to do on the field that day. And to say that he did, I think cheapens what he did. Because our human mind and our human fears come into play, and it's what we do at that point. So we do it all the time. We do it with things in our life. But what if I lose my job? What, what if I lose my house? What if this happens? What if I lose this? And we let that fear control us. Many times we see the risk, we understand what could happen, and we do what we've been taught to do. We get taught growing up to sit down and put two papers in front of you, and one is going to be the pros, and one is going to be the cons. And I can't tell you how many times I've heard Christians talk about the pros and the cons of the decision they're about to make. I'm not saying that it's not responsible at times to, to understand what might happen. But when you allow the pros and the cons to make the decision for you, it's completely backwards of what we're talking about. Is the difference is when I know that what you're asking me to do, Lord, I, I might lose my job. I might lose that relationship. Something might happen. Is I don't look at those pros and cons and go, here's all the negatives. Because I'm going to tell you what, when I've done that in life, I don't remember too many times the pros outweigh the negatives. We can always come up with the negatives. We're really good at that as people. We're really good at coming up with why I shouldn't, couldn't, whatever. But it's when I go into those decisions, when I choose to walk out into that battlefield like David did, when I see the lions did ahead of me, and I'm willing to go, God, I understand the risk. I understand that the negative list is really high right now. But if this is what you're asking me to do, I'm willing to take that risk. I'm willing to take that step. And that's when something amazing happens. Is that's when we realize as children of the king that there is no risk in following God. There is no risk in following God when we know the end result is an eternity with him. Can we lose something? Yeah. And at times we lose things. Can relationships be lost? Yes. Can homes be lost? Yes. Can jobs be lost? Yes. 
But if I take the fear of risk away, knowing that, listen, I'm, the cost is high in the world's view. But if I am stepping into God's will, that is the only decision that I want to make. And I'm not risking anything if it's for the eternity with my king. One of the stories that I love and I've shared over and over is that the story of um, a missionary and his son, and it's in, I think, that book uh, that just is completely full of different missionaries' uh, 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 stories. And, and it's, it's that him and his, <clears throat> he was asked, he was in prison for his beliefs, and uh, after being beaten severely, starved, um, rats were released into his cell, uh, all these horrible things. And they literally said, all you have to do is deny Christ. Deny what you have said to everybody you believe in, and we will release you. And he wasn't willing to. He wasn't willing to. He wasn't willing to. And in the, the story, what they say happens is they bring in his son, who, if I remember right, was a young teenager. And I, I can't remember what age exactly, but a young teenager, not very old. And they tell him, we're going to beat your son to death in front of you, or you can deny Christ. And they begin to beat his son in front of him. And so this whole time he's taken it. He's, he's stood for his beliefs. As a father, as a man, he's, been, he's done that. And now his son is being beaten in front of him. I don't care who you are. I don't care how long you've been a Christian. If you are a father, you understand that that would put you in an incredibly, unbelievably, uh, I don't know if we can even imagine that situation, watching your son being beaten to death. And so at one point, he, he's the one who told this story. He begins to break and he says, stop, stop, stop. Please stop. I'll do whatever it takes. Please leave my son alone. And he tells this story that his son looks at him and says, Father, do not do me the injustice of having a father that's a traitor. So the son that you've raised telling him that this is our king we serve, this is who our God is, and you raise him in his relationship with God, and you tell him we're willing to risk it all, and in the middle of trying to save his life, he looks at you and, and tells you, don't break now. I'm willing to give it all. Don't break now. I don't want a traitor as a father. And here's the, here's the incredible part of this story. His son was beaten to death in front of him. And his father is the one who goes on to share this story and tells of the people that, and the ministry that God performed through that man after this time. And it wasn't, it wasn't him saying, God just decided to sacrifice my son. It was him saying, my son was willing to sacrifice his life for what he stood. And what it did was embolden me and empower me to realize that I was too as a father. He wasn't risking his son's life, just throwing it away. What he was saying was, is I understand the cost. And he understands it greater than probably all of us in this room. And it took his son saying, Dad, I'm willing to give it all. And I'm not willing to watch you give up everything you've told me we stand for. Freedom fighters understand what they're doing. Freedom fighters aren't doing it blindly. They aren't walking out there on the battlefield blindly. Freedom fighters understand what they're called to. The other example I wanted us to look at is the disciples. In Luke 22, we see an incredible example of where Peter learns through failure how to become a freedom fighter. See, Peter's put in that crossroads. He's followed Jesus, he's been taught by Jesus, and now Jesus is being beaten 
and going to be crucified. And he has followed along through the city, watching. And the man that Peter, the brash Peter, that's always stubborn and has probably said many times and did say to Christ himself, I would never betray you. Argued with Jesus that I would never betray you. Sees Jesus in this situation. And after being told by Jesus that, Peter, hey, listen, I love you, but you're, you're going to betray me. In fact, you're going to betray me three times. And this is on the night where, in the world's view, Jesus needed them the most. This is on the night where, where, where Peter, everything that Peter said and, and stood up and said, I'm, I'm this guy, this is where the crossroads was. And a little girl sees him and says, the Bible says, a little girl, but here's what's funny is the Bible says, a little girl calls him out, but then he replies with, woman, I don't know who that is. So a girl of a young age probably looks at Peter and says, hey, I I think you're one of them. I recognize you. You were following him. And he says, that's not me. And then two more times he's asked by two other people, no, I think that is you. And he denies him two more times. Just like Christ told him, he denies him three times. And so here is Peter, who's been trained up, taught by Jesus and he fails at the point that we're talking about in his David moment he walked back to the tents and said I'm not fighting that guy in his Daniel moment he said you know what I said I was willing to face lions in a den but they look really hungry I'm not willing to go I'm not I'll I'll pray with my windows shut (laughs) and they don't have to know I'm praying because honestly that's a really easy solution when you look at that story is you just pray in your house, is what the world will tell you, what our flesh tells us. You, they don't have to know what you're doing. Daniel could have very easily done that. Peter, in that moment, did that. He said, well, I'll shut my windows when I pray. I, I don't know him. But through that failure, through the restoration that Christ brings in his life after he was resurrected, through restoring Peter through love, Peter learns from that moment of betrayal, the moment of his failure, he's restored to become a freedom fighter that would be willing to risk everything and was never again afraid to lose his life for the Son of God. And so I love that the Bible gives us an example of someone that if you had never known that about Peter, you would have never guessed that. If we had just read the story of Peter and what he did and said through much of his time, we would have said, no, Peter won't be the one that will fold. He'll give his life. In fact, he'll probably go down fighting. I love that the Bible shows us that failure, that mistake, and how Jesus restores him and says, I love you, Peter. I love you. I love you. And I know that you love me. And you're going to be the rock that I build my church on. And I'm not going to look at you and see you betraying me when I see you. I'm going to look at you as the man I know you are. The freedom fighter I know you are. And for what you're going to do in my father's kingdom. And many of us have had those crossroads where we have been afraid to give up something. Maybe it's been that relationship. Maybe it's been that job, that security, health insurance, whatever it is. There's tons of things we could do that that have held us back from making a decision that we believe God is asking us to walk in or something that has compromised who we are as a son or daughter of God. We all have had those times where we made the decision that Peter made And in a way, without maybe saying it, we've said, I I don't know him. We've all done that at times. We've all been the person that says, I wasn't a part of that, but I didn't stand up against it either. How many times have we talked about, if you're a parent, we've talked to our kids and said, 
I understand what you're saying, that you weren't a part of that, but you were in the room when it happened. What did you say? What did you do? What's holding us back? Because listen, those ledges on the side of the cliff, those Daniel moments, those David moments, those Peter moments, they're going to happen in our life. And I hate to burst your bubble that, that you think sometimes we think, I've had so many, I'm bound for a good seat. Listen, they're going to continue happening. We're going to have those crossroads in life. We're going to have those, those opportunities to choose him or to choose me, my flesh. To listen to him or to listen to my fears. I'm going to have those opportunities to put the pros and the cons in front of me and allow them to control every decision I make. Those opportunities are going to come. And in those moments where I'm standing on the ledge and I'm, I'm feeling fear come over me and I'm feeling like I can't take another step forward, I'm feeling like I might fall to death. Those are the moments. Those are the moments that he wants to intervene. He wants to empower you to not, to not be a person that just says, listen, I'm throwing everything away because I want to be martyred. Well, I want everybody to see me make this decision to give up that job, and I want everybody to know about it. Those are the moments where he's going to empower you to walk in a freedom that we can never realize. A freedom where we begin to see that there is no risk in stepping out into God's will. I might lose some things, but if I'm in his will, that's not risk. I might have to give up some things, but if I'm in his will, that's not risk. Because I know what I'm walking towards. I know the end result is eternity with him. And Lord, I don't want to get to the end of my life and realize that I was Peter over and over and over and over again, never willing to answer that little girl that says, hey, you're one of them, never willing to look at her and go, you're right, I do follow him. And I was, an, I was one of his disciples. I was one of those men following him. I want to read this scripture. Romans 14, 7 through 9. For none of us lives to himself alone, and none of us dies to himself alone. If we live, we live to the Lord. And if we die, we die to the Lord. So whether we live or die, we belong to the Lord. For this reason, Christ died and returned to life so that he might be the Lord of both the dead and the living. Because of his willingness to make the greatest sacrifice, we don't have to fear following our king. I want to live a life where the only thing I fear is folding to the pressure of the world. I want to live a life where, where I don't look at the pros and cons and I don't look at the stresses and the fears. I want to live a life where I say, God, yes. Yes, before I know what the question is. Yes, before I know what the direction is. Yes, before I know what you're asking me to do. Yes. And I realize that everything you're going to ask me to do, there's going to be negatives and positives in, in all of life. And there's going to be pros and cons in everything I ever do. But yes. Yes, God, because I know if it's what you're asking me to do, then that's where I want to be. That's where I find that freedom. That's where I find that peace and that contentment that so many people run through life searching and clawing after and trying every single thing to fulfill that void in their life. 
And the one thing they're afraid of doing, stepping out in faith, is the one thing that will actually give them that peace. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be sharing, and I'm, gonna, I'm wrapping up right now because we have the business meeting and I want to be respectful of, peop, respectful of your time. I'm really glad that the vision that I believe that he's placed on my heart for this church is, is scary. I, I, don't, I don't know how we're going to accomplish it. And it does make me want to go, oh, there's a lot of pros and cons to that. I'm glad that the vision is so much bigger than all of us because it's his vision and it's what he's calling us into. And I want to step into it in freedom, not controlled by fear or stress or worry. I want to step into it in freedom. That's courage. Is Courage is knowing what you're stepping into, there's, there's all kinds of things that might be lost. But courage is standing on that cliff realizing that, listen, this is dangerous, but I'm willing to do it. I'm willing to walk and take that step. And I would just ask you this morning that if there have been things that are holding you back from completely letting go and holding on to him, he desires to show you a way to release that control and to trust in him. Those Daniel moments are going to come. That's why we train and we grow and we run after him so that when we face those moments, we know what to do and we don't doubt our next step. And we don't live in fear of our next step. We take the step. Would you stand with me? Father, I just pray the Lord, whatever is holding some of us back, God, whatever we have in our life where we haven't given control to you, Lord, those things that are they're causing us to fear, to worry, to stress. Father, I pray that each one of us this morning chooses to release them to you, chooses to lay them at your feet, chooses to follow after you. The God that we, I, I pray a supernatural courage over this body. I pray a supernatural bravery to come upon every single person in this room. Whereas as you show them what step to take, that, Father, they will not only hear your voice, but they'll be willing to step out into your will. And so, Father, I pray new words of wisdom and knowledge and guidance and direction over every single person in this room. I pray that you begin to expand their view of your plan for their life, that you give them a glimpse of what's ahead of them, God. Lord, I pray that you begin to ignite a fire in some of us that, that, that just need to spend more time with you, God, to, to, to spend more time training and growing in the relationship with you so that when those Daniel moments come, Lord, they'll be willing to say, listen, I, understanding what, I understand what you say might happen, but I'm not going to change what I'm doing in my relationship with my God. But Lord, I don't want to be a person that just says, I wasn't a part of that. God, I want to be a person that says, I did what God asked me to do. And so, Father, I just pray your spirit over every single person in this room. I pray your presence in their life, God, that you begin to speak to them and draw them into you. And those things that have been holding us back, God, I pray in the name of Jesus that we break them off in the name of Jesus. Satan, pick up your weapons and flee. You have no victory in this body. In the name of Jesus, we claim victory. We claim freedom in the name of Jesus. We claim that victory in our life. We claim the sacrifice you made has given us freedom. Jesus, we worship you. God, we lift you up and we ask you to, Lord, invade our hearts, to invade our plans, to invade our schedules. 
God, that we want to center our life on you. Lord, we love you. Jesus, we worship you. In your name we pray. Amen.